In the 1840s, Soren Kierkegaard and Karl Marx were both set on exploring human alienation on a philosophical level, as each had the conviction that they would use philosophy to make the world a better place. But the similarity stops here for them. Marx would conclude that human alienation was sourced from economics, a social issue of alienation, where one is isolated from a group, while Kierkegaard would see it as a matter of personal choice, an individual issue of alienation, meaning firstly, that we ourselves are the causes of our alienation, and secondly, that that alienation is one from our own nature as an individual being, resulting in a profound loss of authenticity and a sense of self. And this was a tragedy in Mr. Kierkegaard's eyes, as he thought that the most common form of despair is not being who you are. And so in order to fix this issue, he came up with two principles to apply in the art of becoming an ultimate individual. Number one, be courageous. Similar to what Fyodor Dostoevsky thought, Soren Kierkegaard believed that our greatest privilege as humans is to act freely, that is, to make choices that reflect our own unique independence or personhood. However, at the same time, he understood how anxiety-provoking this pursuit of freedom is, as he put it. Anxiety is always to be understood as oriented toward freedom. And to be specific, this isn't so much the soft anxiety we get from seeing oncoming traffic or a red notification bubble with triple digits. This is rather the deep anxiety of wanting to tell a friend you don't like what they're doing or becoming, or when wanting to confess to your hyper-conservative family that you are attracted to the same sex. In those examples, that is when the world of freedom is opening up to you. But like what Kierkegaard said, these moments of anxiety are only you being oriented toward freedom. And it's only when you act according to what your true self is telling you that you actually exercise freedom. I volunteer as tribute. And so it was for this reason that Kierkegaard saw an act of individuality as also an act of courage, which interestingly enough is also the foundation for ethical behavior. The idea is echoed later in Paul Tillich, an existentialist philosopher and theologian. Courage is an ethical reality, but it is rooted in the whole breadth of human existence and, ultimately, in the structure of being itself. It must be considered ontologically, or the nature of reality, in order to be understood ethically. Now, to help us get a better grasp of his insight, let us consider a non-courageous individual. We'll call him Benny. As a representation of the opposite of what Kierkegaard and Tillich propose, the non-courageous Benny is an individual who goes along with what everyone else says, mimicking the majority of what their opinions are, and same with their interests, hobbies, and other involvements in the world. Now at this point, if you were to sit Benny down and examine him as a person, there would be little to nothing that would define him as an authentic being. He's merely a copy of a copy of a copy. And so in that condition, how could we ever imagine someone like Benny acting on ethical grounds? Consider for instance, if Benny Benny was a German living in Germany in the 1940s. Would you think him capable of standing up against a mass influence as large as the Nazi movement? Mr. Kierkegaard would most likely say no. And this is primarily because he observed that although we are all born with the capability for courage through authentic action, it is still something we must all cultivate. So just to quickly draw this principle out, so far we have the will to freedom, that is our greatest human privilege. The will to freedom then leads to anxiety and that over a choice indicated by our desire. Then at almost the same time, anxiety is followed by a junction where we can choose to act upon our desire or we can choose to not act upon it. But if acted upon, that is a true expression of courage, a courage that then shapes you into a person capable of ethical behavior, which then finally results in you becoming an authentic individual. Number two, be creative. For Kierkegaard, freedom, the kind we just talked about giving rise to anxiety, is ultimately defined as possibility, and that meaning that there is anxiety in any realizing of possibility. So for example, when you realize the possibility of a new job offer, anxiety. An invitation to a concert, anxiety. Traveling to a foreign country, anxiety. And the thing is, the more possibility an individual has available to them, the more potential for anxiety. My diagnosis is that you've experienced a severe anxiety attack. It's not necessarily all bad though, because the more possibility also means the more potential for creativity. You see, Kierkegaard believed that we only have anxiety because we're in the midst of a possibility to create. Now remember how I said that Kierkegaard defined freedom as possibility. Well, that possibility more specifically is a possibility to form a creation, to make yourself into a new person, one that's marked by your own unique potential. So from that perspective, don't see anxiety as this bad thing, because if you didn't have anxiety, that would only indicate that there was no possibility to create a better version of you that matches or meets your potential, whatever that potential may be. Moreover, regardless of the amount of freedom one has, Kierkegaard's advice is the same, to lean into it, make a move, then allow the possibilities to shape themselves out. 
For instance, when you finally act on a job transition, rather than just continuing to think on one, some things will feel like a no, and then clearly shift to a hard no. And that's it. That's how possibilities sort themselves out. Oh, and you're also going to make mistakes along the way. But it doesn't matter so long as you're doing as Kierkegaard says by leaning into it. Or in other words, so long as you're learning and ruling things out. In this way, Kierkegaard is suggesting that the only wrong move is no move at all. As he says, Life can only be understood backwards, but it must be lived forwards. This is because, number one, due to the fact that we have incomplete knowledge, that we don't know everything that there is to know. We can't avoid error. Mistakes are bound to happen. We fucked up. And number two, the reason why life must be lived forward is because, well, the stakes are high. Meaning that if we don't move toward our possibilities, the outcome is more than just missing out on being an ethical person, as if that wasn't bad enough. But it also means that you truly miss out on the essence of what it means to be an individual. In a word, you lose yourself, which according to Kierkegaard is much easier than you might think, as he said. The greatest hazard of all, losing oneself, can occur very quietly in the world, as if it were nothing at all. No other loss can occur so quietly. Any other loss, an arm, a leg, five dollars, a wife, etc., is sure to be noticed. Now as a final note that deserves emphasis, be intentional, but don't get hung up on what move to make. Because creating ourselves is an art form, and like any art, mistakes will be made, or meant to be made. But even the gravest mistake doesn't compare to the sin of inaction, the crime of not affirming oneself through invention. Jennifer Anna Gossetti Ferenci, the author of the book On Being and Becoming, she explains Kierkegaard's imperative this way. In order to embrace our lives as our very own, to shake free from inherited expectations, the pressures of the crowd, or mere habit, we need to exercise invention. Well, that is it for this video, guys. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed it, please give it a thumbs up. And if you have any insights, feedback, please include that in the comment section below. Otherwise, I'll see you in the next one. Thanks for watching.